Good morning, CLC. Happy New Year, Maranatha. Wonderful to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Let's all stand across this sanctuary and invite his presence to be felt. We know God is an omnipresent God. And as we close out this year, the last day of the year, we've come to the right place to do it. We're going to thank the Lord for this past year and what he's done in our life, what he's done in our family. And we're going to thank him for tomorrow as the new year turns and we continue to serve the Lord. Jesus, we come before your throne right now with thanksgiving in our heart this morning. Jesus, we enter into these gates with thanksgiving, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for 2023. We thank you, Lord, for what you've done in this church and what you've done in our life and what you've done in our family, Jesus. You've been consistent. You've always been there, Lord. You never left us nor forsaked us. You provided for our needs, Jesus, and we thank you. There were times when I was in pain and hurting, but Jesus, you came and comforted. You came and strengthened. You give us hope and refuge. Jesus, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the Holy Ghost that dwells within us, that gives us the strength every morning. Jesus, thank you for the sun rising and the sun setting. Jesus, we thank you for the oxygen that is within our breath. Jesus, we glorify you. You are the one and only true God. We thank you, Lord, that we know you and you have a relationship with us. Jesus, we desire you. We long for you, Lord. We want more of you in 2024. Jesus, we recommit, Jesus, our mind, our spirit, and our heart to you once again. Lord, we exalt your name forever, Lord. As long as there is breath in our lungs, we will praise you. We will exalt you. We will glorify you. May your will be done in this service this morning. May your will be done upon every musician and every singer. Let your spirit touch every individual that walks into this sanctuary. Let them feel you, Jesus, once again. All together, let's clap our hands and shout to God with a voice of triumph. Hallelujah! 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 We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated if you like. Let's worship the Lord in song. Hallelujah. We can't thank him enough. Amen. It's New Year's Eve. We made it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout out to the Lord with a voice of triumph. Hallelujah, for he's already given us the victory. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. How many know it's your season to be blessed? Amen.
good God. And all the time, God is good. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No matter what it looks like, people of God, no matter what is going on naturally, we know that he's been good. We serve a faithful God. Amen. If he's been faithful before, he'll be faithful again.
He's a good, good father. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to Jesus. Some trust in chariots. Some trust in gold. Some trust in money. Amen. But I trust in God. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, God, we can trust him. No matter what's going on, people of God, as we go into the new year, keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen. And the things of the world will grow strangely dim. Amen. Hallelujah. Bless your name, Jesus. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. And what he did for me on Calvary was more than enough. Hallelujah. So I trust, I trust in God. God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. Hallelujah. So I trust, I trust in God, my Savior.
to trust in Jesus. Just to take him in his word. And it's just to rest upon every one of his promises. Just to we get to trust in the Lord. Amen. I'm so thankful that I could put my faith in his word because his word, it never changes. Hallelujah. It never changes. He never changes. Amen. Well, church, we've made it to the last day of the year. Hallelujah. How many can testify that the Lord's been good? How many can testify he's brought you through some things this year? And I just have it in my spirit. I am determined that 2024 is going to be the best year yet for the church. Does anybody believe that? And we're not just going to stumble into a great year of revival. How many know that? It's not just going to happen by happenstance, but we got to be intentional, church. And part of that intentionality is this prayer we're praying right now. Our kingdom prayer where we plead the blood over this city. We plead the blood over this state and this nation, this world, and we declare the word of God. What are we doing, Brother Barber? We're standing on the promises. We're laying hold of his word. We're putting our trust not in the systems of this world, not in the elections that are coming up. No, no, no. We put our trust in the word of God. Amen. We put our trust in the one who holds this whole world in his hands. Hallelujah. So all together, church, let's step on the battlefield in Jesus' name. Lord, we plead the blood over our city. Lord, we pray for Stockton, California. God, we pray and we declare, Lord, that this city does not belong to poverty. It does not belong to hopelessness or homelessness or drug addiction. Lord, but this city belongs to you. This Central Valley, this state, this nation. Oh, yes, God, let there be one last great outpouring of your spirit like never before Jesus prepare us Lord as laborers for the harvest prepare us Father as we prepare ourselves to engather this last great harvest in the name of Jesus we pray to the north to the south to the east and to the west we declare that those to be called by the name of Jesus would be released that the prince 
principalities and powers and rulers of wickedness in high places would be brought low, that strongholds would be broken, Lord. Let this church be a lighthouse, a safe haven in the name of Jesus. Lord, we worship you for it today. We praise you, Father, for the great revival that is here. We praise you in advance for backsliders coming home. We praise you in advance for new souls being saved, for addictions being broken, for strongholds being brought down, for lives being transformed. In the name of Jesus, we worship you for it today. Hallelujah. If you believe it, why don't you praise him like you believe it? Praise him in advance. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. We prayed for the needs of the kingdom. Now, if you've come into this house with the need, if you come in with a physical ailment, maybe you need the Lord to provide financially. Maybe you just need peace in your mind. Whatever it may be, my God can meet your need right now. Right now. He's a right now God. Amen. We're not praying for maybe some time down the line, but I believe you can get healed right in this very prayer. Does anybody believe it? Hallelujah. I believe it this morning. I just feel faith in the atmosphere that God can heal you. He can meet your need. Amen. So if you have a need, why don't you slip your hand in the air and say, God, here I am. Oh, yes, I see hands raised all across this building. Church, let's go before the Lord and pray for these needs right now in Jesus' name. Lord, we present these needs in faith this morning, God. I pray for every need in the house, Lord, right now, that every need would be met, God, where healing is needed, Father, that your healing virtue would flow. Where provision is needed, God, that you would provide, Lord. Where there is a crooked path of the mind, maybe the mind is in turmoil, the storms of life are raging. God, I pray you would speak to those storms and say, peace be still. Lord, because you're the peace speaker, in the name of Jesus, I declare it today, Father. Let there be testimonies from this very prayer, God. Let there be testimonies of your wonder-working power, of your miracle-working power. Lord, we pray and we ask these things in Jesus' name this morning as your word instructs us to do so whatsoever we would ask in the name of Jesus and believe it to be done that we would have it for our God is a good God and our father sends down good gifts in the name of Jesus let us be able father to testify of your miracle working power of your wonder working power because you're still a healer and you're still a deliverer and you're still a way maker hallelujah hallelujah we worship you we praise you Jesus amen amen I just feel such a wonderful presence of God this morning amen church you can head back to your seats but do remain standing we just have two brief announcements landmark 2024 amen Coming up January 23rd, 23rd through the 26th. If you don't have that on your calendar yet, you better make the preparations to be here because God is going to move. And in like step with this announcement, our landmark choir rehearsal. How many are in that landmark choir? Amen. Come on. I got to hear it for that landmark choir. There we go. Rehearsal is this Thursday, January 4th at 7 p.m. right in this Christian Lifeway facility. So please be there if you plan to be a part of the Landmark Choir. Amen. Church, it's time for our Sunday morning tithe and offering. Hallelujah. We're going to make our declaration together starting in Malachi 3, 10 and 11. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. Upon the authority of the word of God, we declare that the Lord is our provider, 
As one who tithes and gives offerings, I am entitled to his blessings and protection from the attacks of the enemy. Therefore, I bring my tithe and offering into your storehouse today, knowing that my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. For employees, we claim good jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, promotions and benefits, and favor with our employers and customers in the workplace. For business owners, we claim favorable contracts and growth, and that these businesses will be profitable and a blessing to the kingdom. For his people, the Lord shall supply income, inheritances, estates, interest, rebates, unexpected gifts and blessings, bills and debts will be paid off, allowing me to live debt-free. Since spiritual blessings follow the giver, I declare that my whole family is saved and in relationship with God. We receive perfect health, healing, deliverance, and walking in the divine favor and blessing of the Almighty. I am blessed coming in and going out, and all that I put my hand to do will prosper in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Lord bless you as you give this morning. On the lower floor, you can march. In the balcony, they will wait on you. got one more announcement to make in regards to Landmark. I do want to remind us and and remind us that it's not just for us, but we're going to be blessing the multitude that are coming to Landmark. And as we so do every year, we have three days of prayer and fasting, three days of prayer and fasting. So that will be starting January 8th. So next Monday, We'll be meeting at 5 a.m. for morning prayer and in the evening time at 7 p.m. for uh, prayer. So that's starting January 8th, 9th, and 10th, three days of prayer and fasting. And how many know that all that we do, we want it to be saturated in prayer? Amen. Everything that we do, saturated in prayer and fasting. And so, again, January 8th through the 10th, we'll be starting our prayer and fasting for Landmark. All our guests and visitors, we are so happy to see you in the house of God this morning. Church, why don't you clap your hands and welcome them. Amen. If you do have any questions about the ministry, 
Following service, you can see us in the Genesis room. That's to my right and your left, out in the hallway. Have a cup of coffee. Come and, and ask any questions that you might have. And we just love to get to know you, get to know your name. Amen. Church, why don't you turn? Why don't you see a, see a new face? Why don't you greet a new face this morning in Jesus' name? Amen. Blessed God. Amen. Anyone ready for the word of God today? Hallelujah. Is anyone glad to be in the house of God? Come on. Is anyone glad to be in the house of God? Can we just stand to our feet and raise our voice to heaven and just praise the Lord for a few moments and thank him that he's brought us this far. Hallelujah. We're at the end of the year, and I'm telling you this. I haven't come this far by my own strength. I haven't come this far by my own wisdom. I'm here because of the grace and the power of God has kept me. Hallelujah. Oh, we love you, Jesus, and we give you the glory today. We bless your name. As the service has been uh, progressing on, I have been feeling the heat in my spirit just just turning on and the Fahrenheit just coming on. And I feel the power of God today. I'm so grateful to be here. Amen. There's a word that's been on my heart. And this is not what the, the word that I'm going to be sharing today. But it is uh, the scripture that says, once you have spoken and twice I have heard. That's been really in my spirit today. And I've been thinking to myself, how does that work? For God to speak one time and hear me to hear twice. And the Lord brought it, it, it's like the Lord brought to my mind that, uh, that thing that sometimes happens when somebody speaks something that's so unbelievable and so shocking. You say, wait a second, what, what did you say again, right? And you heard it the first time, but you need to hear it the second to really accept it. Once for awe and second for 
receiving and transformation. Once for understanding and twice for revelation. It's the thought, it's the hearing of God, the hearing of the word that says, I hear you, but it's so powerful. I need to hear it a second time. Now I receive that word. And so my desire today is to hear the word twice. Let me hear it once for understanding. Then let me hear it a second time, God, for revelation. Is that anybody's prayer this morning? Come on, does anybody want to hear twice? God, one for understanding. One, because it's so, your word is so impressive. The first, because your word keeps me in awe. But the second, because I receive it and I'm transformed by it. Can we pray that God would just have his way today through the ministry of his word? God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come before you, Lord. We feel your presence. We have felt your presence your dominion, your hand over this whole service, God. Through the whole worship service, God. Through every song that we've sung, it's like the weight of your hand has been on this place, Lord God. I pray that you would enable our ears to hear you, God. Once for understanding and twice for revelation, God. Once for shock and awe and twice, God, to receive and be transformed by your word, God. May that living word, God, come and move in this place. Let it move through our minds, God. Then it, let it enter our spirits and our souls, God, to change us, God, by your authority. Prepare us, God, for what is to come Prepare us, God, for your plans. Prepare us, God, for the future, Lord. We desire Jesus today. We desire, we desire, we desire, we desire to be in your will in the name of Jesus. And the church said, Amen. amen. Hallelujah. Does anyone know what amen means? Amen. It's not just the, the uh, traditional ending of a prayer. Uh, it's not simply amen to, uh, that is part of some type of pattern or ritual that we do. Amen means so let it be. So let it be. You know, the, the word amen is so important in scripture because it is actually a powerful description of Jesus himself. The word of God says in the book of Revelation that Jesus is the faithful testimony and the amen of God. Jesus is the amen of God. What does that mean? That means that he is the perfect manifestation within time and space of the plan and the will of God. God willed it in the timeless. He willed it in the spiritual and the life of Jesus said, so let it be. Amen. That's how powerful amen is. So when we say amen, we take the prayers that we have prayed. And we say, so let it be within our lives today. So let it be this morning. So let it be in the ministry of the word. So let it be on this Sunday. What is it? The 31st. Hallelujah of December. So let it be. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. I'm privileged to share this word today that I shared in part in um, the Lifeline prayer retreat. And uh, I'm very grateful to share this with the rest of the church. And uh, thankful that um, I'm given more time to really unravel this. Uh, Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 through 2, then we're going to read verses 9 through 11. Uh, today, I want to preach on God, the interrupter of worlds. God, the interrupter of worlds. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Verse 9. 
when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding, exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You may take your seats today in the presence of God. Hallelujah. We start today with the wise men who had seen a significant star in the sky. This star signified something different, something unique was occurring in the cosmos. The star appearing in the sky is an important occurrence because many individuals studied the sky to know the seasons and times that were about to come. In other words, uh, the stars were a cosmic clock. I'm not talking about uh, this in the form of perhaps divination or astrology, but in those times you could study the sky and according to the position of positions of the stars, you would know uh, what season was to come. And so the stars were very important. The stars were very important. Now, the word of God never teaches that the people of God should look to the sky and should look to the stars to know the future. Because the will of God doesn't work that way for the people of God. God is one that imposes himself upon the natural systems of this world. Therefore, he doesn't, he asks his people to look to his word and to his promises to know what is to come. Nevertheless, these wise men saw something different in the sky. Interesting detail about the wise men is that the word of God never mentions that there were three. Uh, the word of God never mentions it was three wise men. This is, comes as a result many times of uh, church history where they painted pictures and they drew things. And they had three kings uh, that would come and they would worship the child that was born, Jesus uh, however, the word of God just says in general, these were wise men. Where do we get three from? It's because they brought three different kinds of uh, presents or three different ways of giving to Jesus through gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But this very well could have been four, five, even ten wise men. It didn't have to be three. These were simply the three kinds of presents that were given to Jesus and these were uh, commodities that uh, Jesus and his family could trade. Why? Because God knew that they would have to run to Egypt. And they could not take typical things, but they had to take uh, uh, commodities or precious things that they could trade wherever they would go. And so they were given gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And so these wise men saw something very significant in the sky. Now, uh, to add a little bit more about the importance of the sky... And the importance of even constellations. Uh, because the sky could be used as a clock. For example, they would see a constellation. And they would see it moving into different positions within the sky. They can tell what was going to happen in, in the future. Not because, of, uh, not because they were some, something powerful or something supernatural. But simply because like a sundial, they knew that if a certain pattern in the sky is in a certain position... Winter is about to come, or spring is about to come, or uh, summer is about to come, or the fall is about to come. It's simply clocks in the sky. It's simply uh, ways of telling time within the sky. Nevertheless, it did not stop certain cultures from beginning to worship false gods through the sky. It, making the mistake in thinking that somehow... These patterns of stars that they called constellations had power over the earth and had power over the physical realm. And so they began attributing gods, 
false gods and idols with certain constellations in the sky. This was a mistake that even Israel made in forgetting who their God was and forgetting Yahweh, the one true living God. They began attributing meaning to the stars with false gods. We can see this in the word of God if we go to uh, the book of Amos chapter 5 verse 26. It says, you also carried Sikketh, your king, and Chun, your idols, the star of your gods, which you made for yourself. Therefore, I will send you into captivity beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts or the God of armies. Wow. So what is this talking about? This is talking about Israel who began to worship God's through the stars and he said because you begin to worship and you're looking to the stars to get some divine meaning and you're not looking to the word of God where the God is giving you his commandments and he has given you his word not so that you can look up but so that look, you can look down into the word and find God he said I'm going to deliver you beyond Damascus because of your idolatry you're too busy looking up into the sky, into the stars, when I need you to look down into the word. The God who created the stars. The God who created all things from the beginning. And this is why he is the eternal father, because he can speak and create something out of nothing. And the church said amen. amen. Acts chapter 7 also uh, it mentions something like this. Regarding the people of God, the Israel who mistaked uh, meaning in the stars. And this is important because today it seems like there's a lot of focus on astrology, which is not the will of God. There should be no Christian that looks to the stars to try to attribute meaning to their own lives. We only go to the word of God for this. Acts chapter 7, verse 39. It says... Whom our fathers would not obey, but rejected, and in their hearts they turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets, did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your God, Remphan, images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. So there was a common practice to look at the stars and try to attribute gods to them. Some examples... Uh, within the east because we see that these wise men were from the east uh, it's likely that they were from the land of Babylon at that time Babylonia had been um, overcome and destroyed and they were at that time a different empire part of a different empire but in the east uh, there were certain forms or certain gods that they would attribute uh, to these constellations for example Enki uh, Enki was a, a Mesopotamian god similar to uh, the Greek god Aquarius, uh, where, which means water pourer, uh, because it would show up in the winter before the rains. So they would look at this certain group of stars, which I, I really don't understand. How can they make images? It takes a lot of imagination to imagine an individual up there in the stars. But there's this group of stars that would show up right before the springtime and right before the rains would begin. And so they attributed somehow a god of, who is of the water pourer and a fish, which was important to Ea or Enki. So it's uh, possible that Pisces came from this. And really what it is is imaginations, trying to make meaning of what they were seeing in the heavens. Inanna had a constellation, she represented grain. This was represented in Greek by Virgo or Ceres for the Romans. This is actually where we get the word cereal. Ceres, cereal is grain. 
and this comes after that certain point in time. Um, and uh, now, that doesn't mean that you are committing idolatry by eating cereal, okay? You're fine having, okay, Honey Nut Cheerios, okay? It's good for your heart, all right? At least that's what they say. Don't believe everything that they say. <laughs> but you're not idol worshiping by eating yourself a bowl of cereal, okay? They're simply words that have been passed down from generation to generation. God is not concerned with those kinds of things. Why? Because God already knows he's more powerful, right, than those things. He's greater and he's above and he knows that he doesn't need to purify the language that is commonly used uh, within humanity, which is why we still say Saturday, even though that word itself comes from uh, Roman uh, Latin uh, I, I, idol worship of Saturn, right? Uh, and that doesn't matter to us. Why? Because God is greater than those things. We are not concerned and we're not obsessed with all of these. Th what could it mean and what is the meaning? There's only one meaning that I need to know, and that is the meaning of the Word of God for my life. Come on, it's the Word of God for my life. All right. Uh, but nevertheless, this was, uh, this was something very significant to those ancient times. Not for the righteous people of God, but for the unrighteous uh, people. Because they had no signs to look to. They had no scripture. They had no Bible to look to. They had no teachings from God. They only had their own legends. They only had their own myths. They had their own religions, their own false religions. And they're constantly trying to look for patterns. And they would try to look for patterns in the sky because they're trying to know how to live their life. They were human attempts at trying to live a life of meaning. They were human and rational attempts at trying to find meaning of their world. But one day in the east something happened after hundreds and hundreds of years of looking to the sky and trying to see patterns and seeing the same patterns year after year and decade after decade and seeing winter come and go and seeing constellations come and go another star interrupted their way of life a star that they had not seen before a star that had no prior meaning a star that was not included in their constellation understanding a star that was not part of their religious way of living a star that had no God attributed to it a star that was new a star that interrupted all of their understanding and they said what is this there is a new star in heaven there is something that has interrupted our way of understanding our world that star was different than any other star that they had seen why because this was the star of Jacob this is the star of the king now in reality this is really the only star that ever has ever meant anything in the sky there's only one other time that uh, God is compared to the star, and he's called the morning star. He's the bright and morning star, which is the sun. But when it comes to the stars in heaven, I did a study on when the king, uh, the concept of the king, uh, the king of kings, and the Messiah was attributed to a star. And the only place that I could find, and it makes sense that this would be a fulfillment of this scripture, uh, it, I could find this is in Numbers uh, chapter 24. Numbers chapter 24. I'm going to go there. Doing a bit of a Bible study today. Is that all right? Amen. Numbers chapter 24, verse 15. Now, to explain a little bit about what's going on here, see, the Word of God is talking about Balaam. Okay. Balak uh, was a king of the Moabites, and he had hired a diviner. His name was Balaam. The Word of God says that this diviner was actually from the east, from the great river. Uh, we uh, uh, Historians and scholars think that the river that is talked about here is not Jordan because Jordan would have been to the west. It was the Euphrates, which means Mesopotamia. 
it was the east and it was the Euphrates. That means that Balaam was a very famous and well-known diviner. He was very famous at doing sorcery and incantations. So Balak, the king of the Moabites, he saw the Israelites coming out of Egypt and they dwelt in his land. And Balak was afraid of the people of Israel because he had heard what God had done through Israel, how he allowed them to walk through dry land and cross the Red Sea, how God had spoke to them through the through a, a mountain, a cloud that came on Mount Sinai. And the word of God says that Balak was so afraid that he called perhaps the most powerful sorcerer that he knew, and that was Balaam. However, God began to speak to Balaam, not because Balaam was a true righteous man, but because God was in a process of interrupting the uh, the the people's faith in false gods and he began speaking to Balaam and he says do not go with him because if you go with him I'm not going to let you curse my people the, he's, he, my name is Yahweh the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings and I have called them to be my people and he told Balaam I will not allow you to curse them nevertheless Balaam went anyways why the word of God says that Balaam loved money and he had greed he loved money more than he uh, loved the things of God even though he knew God very little he was a false worshiper he was in in a, a an individual that simply practiced all kinds of incantations and the word of God says that he twice he made sacrifices to attempt to curse the people of God, but God would impose himself upon this false prophet and he would give him a true word and he would not allow Balaam to curse the people of Israel, but instead of expressing a curse to Israel, he would begin to express a blessing. He would begin to express prosperity to the people of Israel because God was demonstrating his power. Now, really interesting, he did this twice. Twice he did sacrifices to attempt to do some kind of incantation to curse Israel. And then God spoke to him two times without sacrifices. Actually, if we, can, if we start at uh, verse 3 of chapter 24, uh, the word of God says that he took up his uh, oracle and said, The utterance of Balaam, the son of Beor, the utterance of the man whose eyes are opened, the utterance of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open, open. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your dwellings, O Israel, like valleys that stretch out, like gardens by the riverside, like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedars beside waters. He shall pour water from his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters. His king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom exalt, it shall be exalted. Wow. See, the word of God says this, this is very interesting. This is the word of Balaam, he said. The one who sees, the one who has heard the word of God, the one who has fallen backward with eyes wide open. That's powerful. That means that the power of God that imposed itself upon this man was so powerful, he fell, it seems like, into a trance. He fell back with eyes wide open, seeing what God was going to show him. Not allowing him to curse Israel, but saying, I have called Israel to be blessed, and I will force you to bless my people. Whoo! Mm, 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 mm. He took one of the mightiest sorcerers of that day, and he forced him to bless the people of God. <laughs> you know, that, that has some similarities to this day and age. Because we may not be dealing with sorcerers, but sometimes we're doing, dealing with laws and we're dealing with governments and we're dealing with powers in high places. And they're not showing up like sorcerers, but they're showing up like lawmakers and they're showing up like mayors and they're showing up like authorities. But meanwhile, the church is here. We have the blessing of God Almighty. And it doesn't matter who is on the throne, who is in the presidency, God will force them to bless 
bless the people of God because I tell you what, we have a job to do in these last days. We have revival in these last days and God will force he will force this world to bless us. Even when we think they're cursing us. You cannot stop the people of God. Because we're covered by the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Allow me to continue on. The word of God says that when he took up his oracle. This is the fourth prophecy he does. He says again in verse 15 something similar. The utterance of Balaam. The son of Beor. The utterance of the man whose eyes are opened. The utterance of him who hears the words of God and has the knowledge of the Most High. Who sees the vision of the Almighty. Who falls down with his eyes wide open. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel and batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of tumult, which means destruction. In other words, that God, this star, this king of Israel, this king whose kingdom shall be exalted according to the prior prophecy, he will be a scepter. This is a scepter of authority and he will rise out of Israel. And he will batter the brow of Moab and he will destroy the sons of destruction. He will destroy the sons of tumult, which means the sons of chaos. Those who cause chaos within the world. Those who cause suffering within the world. He's here to destroy the sons of of destruction he's come to destroy destruction he's come to destroy chaos he's come to destroy uh, the sin and the lives of individuals that have been destroyed by being bound to sin he's come to destroy the sons of tumult but it says here that a star shall come out of Jacob a scepter shall rise out of Israel wow you see this is the thing, and I, I, we don't quite know the answer to this as to who these wise men were. One thing is for sure that it, it seems that these were they, were, they could have been Jews, they could have been Gentiles. But one thing is for sure that they studied the true word of God because they quoted Amos when talking to Herod. So that means that they both knew the law and they also knew the books of the prophets they knew the book of Amos. They also knew the book of Numbers. And so these were individuals who studied the word of God. And so uh, the word of God says that they were from the east. They were all the way from the east, which could mean the land of Babylonia during this time, even the land of Balaam who lived in the east beyond the river Euphrates. Uh, is, that tells us this. That tells us that perhaps these wise men well knew the, what had occurred here with Balaam when he said that a star shall rise from Jacob. That this star will represent a king. A king whose kingdom will be exalted. A king whose kingdom will be greater than any, of, any kingdom that has ever existed in this world. They knew of this prophecy. And so they saw something unique in the sky that signified the time had come. They saw a star from the east. They noticed in the west a star had arisen. This was the star of the king of the Jews. This was the star that meant something different than any other star. This was the star of one, representing one who was the amen of God. And you see this star was unique because when they found Jesus, that star did not remain. This star did not remain in the sky, but the star disappeared. Why? Because the purpose of the star was not to keep them looking up, but the purpose of the star was that for them to look down at Jesus because the name of Jesus is the God that saves.
saves. And the name of Jesus would be Emmanuel. Not God who is in the sky and the stars. Not a God who is far from you. But his name would be Emmanuel. He is God with us. He is God here. He is God right now. In other words, wise men, once you found him, stop looking up. Because you don't have to look at the sky anymore. You can look down. The king of kings has arrived. The king of kings is here. The Lord of lords is here. He is the king of the Jews. And he is the king of the world. And the, of the expansion of his kingdom, there will be no end. Of the expansion of his authority, there will be no end. The, he will be the desire of nations. And the nations will come and inquire, who is this God? Who is this king? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Horoscopes and astrological signs don't mean anything. They have no meaning. They're simply human attempts at making meaning of their lives. There's only one star that has ever meant anything. That's the star of the king. The star is not there anymore. Once the purpose was established, it disappeared. Now we look to Jesus for meaning. We look to him and his manifestation for meaning for our lives. But one thing is for sure, God continues to be the interrupter of worlds. God continues to be the interrupter of our mortal methods of trying to understand God. He continues to be the interrupter of our common lives. He begins to he continues to be the interrupter of our rituals. He continues to be the interrupter of how we think our life is going to turn out. He's the interrupter of idol worship. He's the interrupter of the systems of this world. He's the interrupter of governments. He's the interrupter of powers who think they have authority up until the people of God show up in the name of Jesus. He's the one who turns cities completely upside down. He's the one who casts out spirits such that diviners can't even do their job. He's the one that shows up and turns the world up upside down and inside out and that's exactly what he's trying to do in Stockton, California and that's exactly what he's trying to do in your life. Hallelujah. That's what he did back then. You see he interrupted the whole world. He interrupted the way that the world even understood how things would function. He understood their understanding of time. He understood he interrupted their form of worship. See he when he manifested, he he interrupted the, for, the way of Zechariah. The Zechariah who was a priest uh, who ministered in the temple uh, and an angel showed up and he said, uh, I'm going to make your wife give birth uh, and this child is going to, na his name will be John the Baptist and he will prepare the way of the Lord. Uh, he interrupted the life of a young lady named Mary. This young lady who was a virgin he said, I'm going to I'm going to plant a seed in your womb by the power of the Holy Spirit and I'm interrupting your world why because you are betrothed you are engaged you are set to get married to a man named Joseph but I'm about to interrupt your human ritual I'm about to interrupt your pattern I'm about to interrupt what you think your life is going to be and I'm going to plant a seed in your womb by the power of the Holy Ghost and in that day a virgin shall give birth to a son and the son's name will be Jesus uh, God with us uh, and he also interrupted perhaps the greatest interruption in this world's existence uh, he interrupted the very concept of life and death uh, because God had destined uh, Jesus Christ uh, to be the savior of humanity he destined Jesus uh, to be the savior of the world 
and he was about to throw away the power, the keys uh, of hell, the power of death uh, and destruction and sin. Uh, and he was going to interrupt uh, the system of the world uh, whose mouth had grown wide open to take souls into hell. Uh, and so God said, I can't see any man that could do this job, so I will save them by my own hand. Uh, and I will come down to the earth. Uh, and Jesus began to cast out demons and he began to resist the principalities why because the king of kings had come but to be able to do do away with death Jesus himself had to die he had to die but he did not remain dead he did what no other man could do do he no one else raised him from the dead he raised himself from the dead he raised himself from the grave why because Jesus is God manifested in the flesh and he has all power over sin and the grave and the word of God says that if Jesus had not risen from the dead, we would be of all men most miserable. Because that would mean that Jesus really did not have power over the most intense, most powerful thing. But Jesus on the third day, not three days later, on the third day, he rose from the dead. He rose from the grave by his own power, by his own might, and he remains alive today. Today. He remains living today. He remains the king who is on the throne. This is the amazing thing about the story of Balaam. <clears throat> that Balaam, who, an individual whose eyes were open to God. The word of God says that he loved greed and money so much that he even after receiving the revelation of God, even after his world got interrupted, he still went back to his old ways. And he still practiced incantations and sorcery. He still looked perhaps to the meaningless stars. And he looked to meaningless worship of idols and wood and, 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 and all kinds of precious metals and gods of this world. He still looked to them for meaning. Why? Because he loved his own desires. He loved his own wants. He loved his own sin. He loved pursuing his own greed. He loved money more than he loved God. That's amazing. He was used to prophesy rightly four times. And even after that, he still went back. Wow. That's incredible. You know, the word of God in First Peter and in the book of Jude talks about the way of Balaam. It talks about that that same spirit and that same attitude can even function today. Now, it's not Balaam manifested again, but it is the way of Balaam. It is the manifestation of Balaam. Balaam. And really, in reality, what the word of God is talking about in 1 Peter, when it says uh, the way of Balaam, it's talking about preachers, teachers, ministers of the gospel who love their own flesh and their own sin so much that they're willing to teach the people false things. Not because they actually believe false teachings, but because they themselves want to practice those sinful things. So they'd rather preach a false teaching or not teach it at all so that they can practice the desires of their own flesh. This is the way of Balaam. And, and, and so the way of Balaam is so powerful that God can even give you a revelation of who he is. He can show you who he is like he did to Balaam. He can manifest himself and say the star of Jacob is here. I, you can see it, but not now. You can behold it, but not yet. And you can see the manifestation of God and yet be so consumed with your own carnal desires that you run back to your old sin. And the word of God says that this, the way of Balaam is like a dog that returns to its own vomit. An instinctual animal that can't help but turn back to the old sin. That's exactly what Balaam did. But not only did Balaam do that, he also taught Balak how to, how to get the people of Israel Israel to curse themselves not that M Moab or not that Balaam had the power over the people but he he 
offered a method to Balak to corrupt the people of God so that they can curse themselves through their own greed, through their own lust, and through their own sinful desires. Wow. You see, this, although 1 Peter applies the way of Balaam, and this is a hard word, but I believe it's something that we all have to be very aware of, okay? Although the word of God does talk about the way of Balaam, particularly in uh, the, con the concept of teachers and preachers uh, who teach uh, the people false things so that they themselves can practice that sin, right? And they, oftentimes we see this in the world today, right, uh, uh, with ways of, oh, you know, God doesn't care that you go here, that you go there, or that you drink this or that you drink that. God doesn't care. Right? When preachers begin to teach those kinds of things, that's not because they actually believe it. It's because they want to go home and they want to drink themselves. They want to practice those things themselves. This is the way of Balaam. This is the way of Balaam. I've received a revelation. It's totally okay. It's totally fine now. We can do this and we can do that. And they're here. Why? It's not they don't actually believe it. It's because they want to satiate their own sensual desires. And by sensual, I simply mean their own animalistic instincts to try to enjoy this world. But that is also not beyond us. That's not beyond you and me. Even in our normal lives. Because we, many of us may not be preachers. I'm a preacher, so I have to be very careful. I have to very care be careful to preach the whole counsel of the word of God, even if it destroys me, even if it speaks against me, even if it destroys and it convicts my own life. I have a responsibility to preach the truth of the word of God. But what happens when you, as a grandfather, as a grandmother, as a mother or as a father, as an older brother or an older sister, are tempted to water down the truth of the word of God. To justify your own actions. Lord help us Jesus. When we begin to stop teaching our children the ways of the Lord. Why? Because, not because we actually believe it. But because we want to watch that on a Saturday night. And we want to go there on a Friday night. And so we say, has, has, hath God really said? Hath God really said? And we're tempted with the way of Balaam. We're tempted with the way of greed. Because we want to satisfy our own desires. We're careful not to teach them to our children. Because the Lord knows children, they are brave. And they say, they'll, say, they'll say things like, uh, uh, Daddy, didn't, didn't pastor preach against that on Sunday? They're innocent. They see things as they are, which is why if you're not like a child, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. They're simple-minded, and they know what they've heard. They know what they've heard in Sunday school. They know what they've heard on family nights, on Wednesday nights. They know what they've heard from the pulpit, from your pastor. And they're talking, and they're saying, didn't pastor, didn't, aren't, didn't they teach something about that? And you have to be careful at that own time, because out of the mouth of babes, they're teaching you something, and God is trying to convict you about something, but instead you say things like, well, that doesn't really apply to us, and no, that's not really the way that it is, and everyone has their own way of moving and working, and you know, it's okay to sin sometimes. I'm here to tell you, it's never okay to sin. It's never okay to sin. Now, understand me, I am not saying that you need to be perfect. That's not what God expects. He doesn't expect perfection. It's not okay to sin. But God has created a throne of grace. He's created grace for us. Not so that we can sin and sin again. Shall we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. 
God forgive, forbid that we would sin just because we know that God will forgive us. And I'm here to tell you today, I am not a perfect individual. I very well, I sin sometimes and I got to go to the same throne room of grace that you do. But one thing is for sure, I will never accept the sin as who I am. I will never accept that wrongdoing as part of myself. I will never justify it. I will say I was wrong. I was wrong and it still continues to be wrong but thank God for the blood the blood that still has power the blood that can still wash me of my sin I don't know about you but I've needed the blood every day of my life I've needed the grace of God I could tell you one thing, if you ever see Brother Abrego do wrong, I'm here to tell you that I am not right. And I need to submit myself to the blood just like anybody else. Because I refuse to walk the way of Balaam. I refuse to walk the way of greed. I refuse to walk the way. I refuse to water down the tree teaching of the word of God. I refuse to preach anything less except Jesus, the only name under heaven by which we shall be saved. I refuse to teach anything less than the baptism in Jesus' name. I refuse to preach anything less than receiving the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in other tongues. I refuse to preach anything less than we need to be holy for He is holy and we need to live our lives right. And sometimes I'm not holy, but in those times, I'm going to submit myself to the grace of God and the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, help me, Jesus. Help us, God. Help us, God. And you see, this is the thing. God can interrupt your world and you still not obey him and follow him. I believe in 2024, God... He's going to go. He is determined to interrupt the world of CLC in 2024. He's going to try to interrupt your world. And the star is going to rise in your life. You're going to see a star from the east. You say, God, I hear your word. And even God's going to reveal himself to you. And you're going to be like Balaam who says, I, I, Joshua Abrego. Whose eyes has seen the Almighty, who falls back in the power of God with eyes wide open. I see the Lord and I see the blessing of God. And in that moment in time, I'll need to choose what to do for myself. I'll need to choose and I'll say, will I follow my own way and will I follow, fall back into my old practices or I, am I going to let God, the interrupter of my world, to guide me and take me into a new way? Am I going to let God lead me into holiness? Am I going to let God lead me into revelation? Because once he has spoken, but twice I want to hear, I want to understand what God has to say but not only do I want to understand I want to be transformed by God's word even if it convicts me even if it changes me even if it changes my direction I'm ready I want to be interrupted I want God to change my life I want to be different I want to be made new I want to for God to take out this heart of stone and make it flesh. I want to serve God with more passion than ever before. I want to be on fire for God more than ever before. I want to praise him better than before. I want to worship him more than before. I want to preach the word of God harder than before. I want to be ready for the rapture more than ever before. I want to make it. I want to make it. I want to make it. Hey, hey, can we stand to our feet today? God, in the praise team, if you can come up and just minister something in the Holy Ghost. How will God interrupt your life? That's the question. In what way, in what manner will the star rise? And will you see God is calling me to a higher plane? He's calling me to something greater. 
Will you turn towards him and walk towards him? Or will you return back to the land of your people? As Balaam did. He saw the will of God. He did not, he, he saw the word of God. He had a revelation of God. But then he didn't go back down to worship Yahweh. The word of God says that he turned around and he went back to his old ways of living. He went back. Can I tell you in, in receiving revelation, in receiving the word of God, <clears throat> In receiving what God wants to do in your life in this new year. Sometimes it's not going to be pleasure. It's not going to be nice. Sometimes it's going to hurt. Sometimes it's going to cause, it's going to force you to be in a place of pain. <clears throat> but most times, most times, it's going to be both. Right? Right? We, we make a mistake. We make a mistake of assuming that it's either one or the other. Either God's going to call us into something that's going to feel so good or God's going to call us to something that's going to really hurt. Um, it's hardly never one or the other. That is the paradox of living for God. It's almost always both. It feels so good to feel the power of God in this altar. But it also, ooh, it hurts because I know God is calling me to something greater. It feels so good to be convicted by the Spirit of God and the Word of God. But it also feels so bad because I know God is calling me to change. It's this, it's this paradox. It feels so good to have the Spirit plant a seed in Mary's womb. But it feels so bad to be accused that perhaps you were unfaithful. You were an adulterer and fornicator. Right? It feels so good to, fe to see an angel and have them tell me, as Zechariah, if I were Zechariah, have him tell me that I will have a son that will prepare the way of the Messiah. But it doesn't feel good to be mute for nine months and not be able to speak until the child is born. It feels so good, right, to be the savior of the world. But even on the cross, Jesus himself shouted out and he said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, why have you forsaken me? Why? Because the pain is necessary. That pain is necessary. Why? Because it's asking for change. The mortal flesh had to die so that the glorified flesh would be able to raise again. And that's the amazing thing about living for God it's going to hurt but it's also going to feel so good yeah. <clears throat> the the uh, mysterious thing about sacrifice and the, anyone who has been willing to sacrifice and make changes you know exactly what I mean the mysterious thing about sacrifice is that it it has to our flesh and to our human mind only the illusion of loss it's the illusion of losing something. But you're really not losing anything when you sacrifice. That's the reality. But it feels like you're losing something before it actually happens. God, shall I give you the, the lamb that costed me so much money? Shall I give you something that hurts me? It feels so hard to give you this. It, it, it hurts so much to give up. And God is trying to convince you and say it's going to be worth it. And within us, there's a conflict that says, but I'm going to lose so much. But I'm going to give up so much. But it's going to hurt so much. But can I tell you today, when you sacrifice for the things of God, it's only an illusion that you will lose anything. Because I don't know about you, but I have never regretted walking with God any day of my life. When I've chosen to live for Him, when I've chosen to follow him I have never ended up regretting it but the illusion of loss when I receive the blessing of God I have known it is worth it 
it to give it all for him. It is worth it to live for him. It is worth it to give up. It is worth it to give in to his will. It is worth it to pursue him. It's worth it to let go of anything that I need to let go of. It's only the loss is only an illusion. The gain, the joy, the peace the love, the happiness. It will be greater in the end if you're only willing to give in and say, God, I see the star rising and I will follow you because I'm looking for you. And I, I, the one who fall back with eyes wide open to see the will of God, I not only want to hear your word, but I want to follow your word to the end. I'm committed to following you. I'm committed to doing your will. I'm committed to, to start this journey of transformation. I want to invite you. Does anyone want to do that this morning? I want to invite you to this altar and we're going to pray together. And we're going to pray, God, no matter what it takes. No matter what it takes, God, I'm determined to follow you. Lord, no matter what it takes, I'm determined to follow you. I give you permission to interrupt my life. I want to give you permission to interrupt my world. This is a hard prayer. I want to give you permission to interrupt my career. I want to give you permission to interrupt my family. I want to give you permission to interrupt my plans for my future, God. Oh God, I'm more loyal to your will than I am to my own plans and my own fantasies. Lord God, I'm giving in, Lord Jesus. Somebody has got to be willing to say it. Somebody has to be willing to pray it. Somebody has to dare to pray this prayer. God, I'm more loyal to you than I am to myself. I'm more loyal to you than I am to my own life. I'm more loyal to you than I am to my own plans. Come on, somebody give in to the word of God. Somebody give in to the revelation of God. Once you have spoken, God, and twice I have heard, all power belongs to you, Lord Jesus. Have your way and take dominion, God, over our lives. In Jesus' name. me.